So today I'm joined by Kyle Coleman, who's the VP of Revenue, Growth and Enablement at Clary. Kyle, thank you for joining us today. Um, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about yourself and Clary and maybe something that people don't know. Uh, yeah, sure. So I began my career in tech about eight years ago at a company called Looker, a BI and analytics company based in Santa Cruz, California. I was the sixth employee there. And over the course of about six years, we scaled up to about 800 employees, uh, took revenue over 100 million, and then was acquired by Google in the summer of 2019 for two and a half billion dollars. Uh, so that one went pretty well. I, uh, I led the SDR team at, at that point, um, really scaling up the team, the, the tools, technology, process, all of that sort of thing, and working in close partnership uh, across the aisle with my pals in demand generation and marketing mm. pretty much the entire time. I reported directly to our CMO for the majority of the time. I jumped over to Clary in, the, uh, in February, March of 2019, and I initially took on enablement as well as sales development. There was something of a, a vacuum in leadership on the marketing side. So I gravitated mm. toward the demand and ABM components because I had experience doing it at Looker and um, became official in the fall of 2019 that I took on this growth and enablement role, which is demand gen, field marketing, SDR, as well as sales enablement. So an interesting purview that's all about creating and accelerating uh, pipeline and revenue. Yeah, which obviously a lot of companies are migrating that way at the moment in terms of these kind of growth roles and uh, chief revenue officers. Um, exactly. Question for you then. So Clary, tell us a little bit about Clary. We'll dig into it in a bit more detail later, but just give us an overview of, what, of who Clary is. What kind of company is it? Sure. So Clary is a revenue operations platform that is useful for pretty much any stakeholder across the revenue uh, department, the revenue engine. So everything from marketing to sales, mm -hmm. SDR, customer success, your C-suite, your board of directors, even anybody who has a stake in creating and closing revenue and growing revenue at your company, Clary makes an impact. Um, so it makes it very, very easy for individual salespeople to submit their forecasts. There's predictive um, AI and machine learning algorithms that are giving, assigning scores to all the different uh, active deals and predicting likelihood to close. So we always have a really good finger on the pulse of what's happening in the current quarter, as well as from my, from uh, you know, more of a top of funnel use case, I have a really good idea of what's going to happen in next quarter and mm. Q plus two, because I have really, really nice and sophisticated views of all the different pipeline and pipeline categories that we have, as well as historical conversion rates for those different pipeline categories and real-time calculations of how much pipeline coverage I need to create in order to support the revenue targets for upcoming quarters. So a whole myriad of use cases uh, across the revenue engine, um, all about streamlining that process of creating revenue. Okay. Well, listen, we'll, we'll dig that into, into that a little bit more detail as we go through the, um, the, um, the, our conversation. But just, um, we were obviously talking the other day, and um, obviously, we're, we're all living through rather extraordinary times at the moment. Um, and obviously, you're on the West Coast of the United States, and obviously, we're over here in Europe. But um, on a personal level, what have, you, what have you learned over the course of the last couple of months? Yeah, the biggest learning for me, Declan, has been, and I knew this already, but this has been a really nice forcing function for the, the lesson to really hit home, which is mm. individual autonomy is extremely important for people to excel in their, in their roles. Um, I, I think creating my job as a leader, I view it to create the structure for what needs to happen and why it needs to happen. So mm -hmm. how is what we're doing in pursuit of broader company goals? But it's up to the individuals to bottoms up, how are they gonna make it happen? It's totally up to them. And so this work from home environment has taken this philosophy to an entirely different level because we, we can't literally see what people are yeah. doing hour by hour, day by day. We, uh, you know, we have check-ins with folks across the SDR and demand teams and field marketing teams, but being far more hands-off uh, across the board at Clary than we had been in the past. And the results have been fantastic. The productivity has been incredible incredibly impressive. The output, the throughput, the speed, the coordination that individual teams are using. And, and uh, it's just been really, um, really inspiring to see how the various individual contributors are able to just excel in their role without direct oversight from a managerial layer. 
So that, um, that probably points to a new way of working if and when we return to a, a level of normality, right? I certainly think so. I think there's mm. going to be much more of an appetite for allowing remote work, having more kind of hybrid mm. roles where the, the headquarter is still very important. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's something irreplaceable about having everybody in the same room with a blank whiteboard and just seeing what happens. So yeah. I don't feel like we can completely replicate that yet with the technology that we have as, as fantastic as Zoom has been for us all. Um, but I think that companies will be much more open-minded about entertaining some sort of hybrid uh, setup where they have some remote employees, some headquarter employees, and, and they just figure it out. Mm. Now, you talk a lot about a new category, um, revenue operations. Um, talk us through that. You, 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 you mentioned it at the beginning um, there somewhat, but talk us through that a little bit, how you see that as being important for organizations. Yeah, sure thing. So their revenue operations is a fledgling sort of um, category that's in its nascency right now. And it means mm. different things to different people as new categories do. You know, if you would have asked people five years ago what customer success was, you would have gotten five different answers from five different people. And that's kind of where mm. revenue operations is right now. A lot of people think that revenue operations is simply a coming together of sales ops, marketing ops, and CS ops. And that is not wrong, but it's too limited a view in, in, from Clary's perspective. Clary thinks about revenue operations as the suite of people and tools and technologies that make up your entire revenue process. So a lot of companies think about you know, revenue just as the outcome that happens as a result of running yeah. business, where Clary thinks about it as a process that can be broken down and analyzed into its component parts. And every one of those component parts is its own little flywheel that helps, um, you know, complete this entire revenue process on, on the whole. So that's what revenue operations is. It's understanding what your revenue process is and it's breaking it down and optimizing every single handoff, every single little uh, conversion lever along the way. And that's where obviously Clary comes in to be able to look at an organization and to try to look at those flywheels, as you say. It's exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. So for example, um, a lot of the handoffs that we think about from a revenue operations and a revenue process standpoint have to do with forecasting. So mm. my handoff to the sales team is about current quarter and out quarter forecasting. And the, the sales team's handoff to CS is about closing business and renewal opportunities. And then the CS team is forecasting how much they think is going to churn, what their expansion and upsell looks like. And so there's a forecast component to every part of this revenue process that drives predictability and informs the operating plan from a finance perspective so that mm. the entire company understands what's happening and what we can do as a result. So is this linked to, to some of the messaging that I've seen around Clary, which is around visibility, responsibility, and transparency? Exactly right. And so when you talk, when you talk about um, visibility and, and transparency, you, you also talked about at the beginning of the conversation a little bit around the kind of the, the ability to, to have predictable revenue. Yeah, exactly. So the way that Clary allows this to happen, and you know, again, this is somewhat tool agnostic because you can do a lot of this analysis just in your own CRM. It just takes a lot more effort. It takes a lot more work and, and some fancy footwork by your operations teams. Um, but what Clary allows every company to do is to look at the aggregate level. So the pipeline categories that I talked about and assess the health of, you know, we have X million dollars in our commit category. What does that mean? And Clary surfaces, hey, in the last four quarters, here's how you've converted that commit um, pipeline to close. And so we know, okay, we can expect and predict that this X million dollars in commit pipeline inventory is going to turn into X million dollars in actual closed business and revenue. And we can do that for every single pipeline stage or category that we have from a top of funnel perspective. Very, very useful. Secondly, this, from, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Carl. And this is where you, you mentioned that you're, you're deploying artificial intelligence and machine learning. Exactly, exactly. So this is kind of on the, that's the aggregate level that I just explained. On the more mm. deal, individual deal level, every single uh, active opportunity gets a score of zero to 100. 100 mm. is, is this opportunity behaving like a closed one opportunity in the past? And a zero is, you know, closed lost. So what we're able to do from a deal acceleration standpoint in close partnership with sales is we're able to very quickly see which of these deals, the larger deals, 
are uh, in a later stage category, let's say they're in a commit category, we're expecting them to close, but the CRM score is low. Why is that CRM score low? So that's our, our likelihood to close. We call it our CRM score. And if we see that trend happening, then we, from a, a marketing and ABM standpoint, are able to say, these are the accounts, these are the opportunities that we that deserve an outsized amount of our account-based marketing dollars because they're the ones that we're banking on. <laughs> they're the mm. big deals that we've already, they're in the commit category. We need to do whatever we can to create more surround sound or get in front of the buying committee or you know just build more awareness for Clary to help move this deal forward. And so that deal level perspective and the predictive components of that deal level perspective is really unifying for the entire revenue engine. And you just alluded then to account-based marketing, ABM. How, how do you see Clary helping companies do better ABM? Yeah, really good question. So I, I just outlined one, uh, one key way, which is having a really quick and fully transparent lens into the accounts that need the most attention and will mm. make the biggest impact on the business. So in my past, the way that I have, uh, quote unquote, prioritized accounts for ABM has been basically whoever the loudest rep was, which, which rep is kicking and screaming the loudest. And more often than not, the squeakiest wheel gets the grease. Mm -hmm. And that's, you, there are some virtues to that, but there are probably more negatives to that. And what yeah. ends up happening is we direct our ABM dollars to not, not the right accounts or, you know, for the wrong reasons, I should say. And so what Clary allows you to do is have a, again, a, everybody has the same view. So we can all see which accounts are actually A, the right size and will actually impact the business from a revenue standpoint. And B, actually need the support. Which ones are, are not trending as well as they need to? And what are the plays that we have in our kind of a la carte menu of ABM that are applicable to these various scenarios? And so in my every one-on-one -on -one that I have with our sales leadership, our, our area of vice presidents, this is the conversation. We look at their active pipeline inventory for the current quarter and for the next quarter, and we bucket each one of the, the at-risk deals into various um, kind of plays that we can run, and then we go and execute. And so the third way that Clary then helps is that we can monitor exactly what's happening in real time, and we have a really, really good idea of, is our ABM program actually making a difference here? We can look at stage progression. We can look at deal size mm -hmm. changes. We can monitor that CRM score. And we know always are the programs we're running actually making a difference from a revenue standpoint. So that links in nicely to the whole theme of data. Well, obviously data is the foundation of any successful ABM program. Are there any insights you can give us around that? Yeah, sure thing. So um, there's a few different sort of data points that are, that are important for ABM. Well, there's so many. Um, mm -hmm. We use Sixth Sense for our intent data. Um, I assume that the audience is pretty familiar with Sixth yeah. Sense, um, but super useful to understand what companies are searching for uh, from an anonymous web activity standpoint. And Clary and any company defines the set of keywords that matter to them. And then Sixth Sense tells us, hey, this company is searching for like sales forecasting or sales productivity or something like that. And that is a cue that our SDR and our sales team uses to then prioritize that account for outreach. So uh, intent data and ABM, super useful for prioritizing accounts to get open the door. But then ABM is also useful for acceleration and for closing the door um, on these accounts and uh, through the various motions that I just described, um, mm. making sure that the data that we see is accurate is probably the hardest part of in-flight deals because salespeople are not famous for their data appending or CRM cleanliness skills. Mm -hmm. And so what Clary helps with is Clary will connect automatically to your seller's email and calendar clients and ingest and harvest all of that email and uh, calendar activity back into your database automatically. So you can see, are our sellers actually engaged with this company? What kind of emails have been exchanged? When is the next meeting coming up? When was the last meeting? What can we do to help um, you know, get the right people in the room? Um, Clary is also automatically capturing every attendee that's on a meeting. So if somebody doesn't exist in our CRM and that CMO, let's say, is on that next call that we have, Clary will take that person, add them as a contact in our CRM, enrich the, um, the contact record, and add them to the opportunity so we have full attribution type tracking as well. Mm. So in your experience, where would you say that the majority of companies fail when it comes to their kind of sales process? Or is it the human, on the human side? Is it on the process side? Is it on the technology side? Or Yeah, it's 
on from a sales process standpoint, I think it's probably more on the human side in a couple key ways. Um, mm. One is from a deal acceleration or deal execution, pardon me, standpoint where sales management is so focused on interrogating reps about basic facts about a deal that they mm. don't spend enough time actually coaching their reps and providing the right guidance to help that deal close. Yeah. So simply by not, uh, or I should say simply by exposing the data and allowing for that kind of transparency and visibility into every deal, Clary helps avoid that completely because everybody has the same set of facts right in front of them, mm -hmm. um, automatically capturing activity, et cetera. And so the conversations that uh, Clary users are able to have is really one of strategy and execution. Now, the second part that people fall down on is the coordination between teams and People get, I, I think, as companies grow, especially in silos start to form a bit more and specialties start to creep in, teams become less disposed to actually working with each mm. other and get so focused on their own success metrics, like how many MQLs are we producing, that they forget that MQLs are meaningless unless it actually turns into revenue. Yeah. And so keeping that, keeping that constant, um, the, the working or the togetherness of these various uh, members of the revenue organization is extremely important for companies to do this well. And that's what I like most about ABM is that by necessity, it includes marketing, SDR, sales, CS, execs, everybody who's involved. Um, so you make sure that, you know, that process is one that can and should include everybody and mm. everybody therefore is accountable for its success. Yeah. Now, obviously you're there at home in, in California. Um, and I'm obviously at home at, here in Spain. Um, are you and your organization, are you finding it harder or easier to have conversations with your customers and prospects? Good question. Um, I would say the first couple weeks as we got used to this, or as we, you know, we kind of delved into the uncertainty mm. of the current events, things were pretty slow <laughs> from a, a conversation standpoint with both prospects and customers. Just mm -hmm. nobody had bandwidth to talk to external vendors because they were just trying to get their own house in order. And we were the same yeah. way. Like I was beating people away and, and it, was, uh, it was very, very busy, but it didn't feel as productive as a result because mm -hmm. it was just figuring things out. The dust has settled a bit and people, there's more certainty, obviously not complete certainty now, but more certainty than there was before. Companies, for the large part, have um, replanned their operating plan so they understand their budget, their finances, things like that. And from what I can tell, especially at the top of the funnel, people are still interested in hearing what's out there. People are still interested in, in evaluating vendors because they know that maybe businesses hasn't returned to normal quite yet, but it will at some point. And mm. so keeping your finger on the pulse of the vendors that can help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish is super important. Um, mm. So I would say that uh, there's momentum at the top of the funnel. I think that getting things through the funnel still is going to be a little bit slower than it was pre-COVID, but hopefully that that will uh, that tide will start to change soon. Yeah, and and linked to that, Kyle, what what advice would you give to to companies at the moment looking to prospect? Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I, I could give the the vague and general be empathetic type uh, type messaging, yeah. but I don't think that that's super useful. Um, the again and i'm going to go back to the abm sort of mindset here uh, another thing that i like about the abm mindset is it forces you as a marketing and sales organization to really understand the accounts and why the accounts should care about you mm. and so therefore my advice to top of funnel leaders sdrs salespeople is one-to-one -one messaging right now wins the day i promise you quality based outreach quality-based campaigns that are one-to-one -one or, or one-to-few if you want to take mm. an industry-based approach, that is going to be what sets you up for success and really resonates with the companies that you're reaching out to. It is not about quantity at this point. Um, you're going to burn yourself if you just business as usual, keep the pedal down on all the, the, the cadences and the nurture streams and everything you had going pre-COVID. You have to rethink your strategy and think about how your company and product and solution aligns with the strategic growth initiatives of the companies that you're the best fit for right now. I think that's excellent advice, Kyle. And I think that definitely um, is something that we're seeing also here in, in Europe. Um, just finally, um, 
you're incredibly active on LinkedIn and you know, I follow you and I follow your posts and uh, I engage with, with many of the things that you write about. How important is that channel for you? And, um, and, and what learnings do you have to share on best practice? Yeah, great question, Declan. I started doing this and being more active on LinkedIn um, at the beginning of the year, uh, really as kind of a challenge to myself to set time aside every day with just a pen and a paper to think and to write. You know, we've mm. become so addicted to the, the devices and things like that, and I'm still guilty of that. So I don't want to absolve <laughs> myself of that particular addiction. Um, but it's been really nice just to set 15 or 30 minutes aside and, and just write. And it turns out the only thing that I really ever think about is work. <laughs> and so LinkedIn turned into a, a pretty nice outlet for me to share my thoughts and my experiences yeah. and things like that. From a um, value to clarity perspective, it's been extremely beneficial, maybe not the bottom line uh, quite yet from a revenue standpoint, but certainly for recruiting, um, for awareness, for driving attendance to different events and things like that. If, and I'm um, particularly well suited for this because our target market, the salespeople, <laughs> are the most active yeah. people on LinkedIn. So this advice maybe yeah. won't translate to, to everybody out there, but um, I, I think to a certain extent it will. My advice is don't just post a link for a webinar and expect people to engage. Have a perspective about why that webinar matters, the value that people are going to get. And if you can weave that value into more of a narrative, this is the type of information that people like to consume. People like to consume stories and they like to understand mm -hmm. narrative and, and they want to see that you have a perspective. So if you can kind of do all of those things in 1300 characters, which LinkedIn allows, then you're going to set yourself up for a ton of success. Um, I think one post, and the other nice thing is that you can get your whole company to engage around mm. these posts as well. And so recently we, we ran a webinar that was specific for sales ops people and I wrote a post about it. And then what we had was all of the individual sellers, um, they tagged their prospects or customers at, in the comment section of my post. And we drove like 150 registrations to this one event. We sold it out in, <laughs> in a flash. Um, and so it's a really useful tactic to, um, to go beyond kind of the traditional, you know, branded yeah. posts and make sure that your, your employees have a perspective and have a voice because people buy from people. And so having your people be active on LinkedIn is a really nice way to make sure that happens. Well, I mean, I can definitely say that, you know, having said that, I've been following you for some time now and, and I think you're having a huge impact and, and you're definitely um, creating, you know, a, um, a personal brand for yourself that is, that is um, standing out from the, uh, from the, um, the noise, so to speak. So uh, it's definitely working. And I think the, the comment you mentioned around the webinars, like we've definitely seen the same thing ourselves with our own, um, our own approach to, um, to social selling that if you can create a voice, if you can create a story, then people will you know, engage and they will follow. And I think that you don't necessarily see the dollars coming in straight away, but you definitely see engagement and you definitely see people wanting to learn more. That's exactly right. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Kyle, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for joining me and I uh, hope everything is okay there for you in California on the West Coast. Likewise. Be well, Declan. Appreciate it.